and we will begin by playing the piece stirring. <coughs> Thank you. 
explaining what he means in this piece. It's a lot of fun. And he has a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, um, so first, the name of this piece is Stern. This is a duet that I compose myself. Um, I have many other influences, which I will I can talk to you afterwards if you have any questions about that, after the lecture or side of it. But this is a, a duet that I have composed um, for the marimba, and then we also have the double second steel hands. Um, I would like to uh, give you guys a little insight on both of the instruments before we actually go further into the form and everything else that we would like to discuss this evening. Um, since the early 20th century, composers have written for marimba in light ensemble, large ensemble, orchestral music, chamber music, concerto settings, and solo settings. The marimba became more popular and used in music over time. Uh, for the steel pan, it began in the 1940s in Trinidad as an ensemble instrument. Later, as the pan was brought to the U uh, United States, uh, composers began writing uh, art music works for the instrument in several contexts. For example, the first one is a concerto from Jan Bach. He did this one for Liam T, which is very well known in the world of still pan. Um, the second one would be still pan ensembles, which you can actually know in elementary schools, high schools, and many colleges. For instance, Miami University still, uh, still band here. And then the third would be pan with other instruments, such as jazz combo. So you can play with the still pan with many other instruments, even uh, voice as well. Um, for the combination of marimba and pan, it's relatively recent. It's kind of new. Um, the earliest work composed for marimba and pan that I'm aware of, it's uh, M. Glock and Melodian by Thomas Kozumbik, uh, which is in April 2007. The next one I uh, learned of was uh, Karakanai by Andy Akio, which is June 2007. That's very close, April and June. Um, and then the next one is Open Window 2010 by Liam Teague and Robert Chapman. Um, stirring is my contribution to the idiom of marimba and pan combination. Now we're going to talk about the form of stirring. The word form is defined as the organizing element in music. This is the overall design in stirring, as you can see, the, uh, how it's color coded and everything to show you the differences in its layers. The next thing I want to define is the words uh, arch form. I want to define that to you for a moment so we'll be able to be on the same page. Arch form in the simplest arrangement is identical with ternary form, basically containing three sections, A, B, A. The first is repeated after a contrasting middle section. Uh, the form may be extended to generate a larger arch. For example, you can have A, B, C, B, A. The first two sections are repeated in reverse order after the contrasting middle section, uh, thus creating a mirror symmetry between the pieces. Um, the, excuse me, between the sections, actually. Stirring has a form that is similar to the structure of arch form. If you remove sections C and D, as you can see, it's not included. The arch form is easier to be identified. There are five sections repeated in reverse order after the contrasting middle section. The contrasting middle section will be E, which forms the mirror symmetry. With a deeper analysis of the first example containing the arch form without section C and D, there is a smaller arch form within the general arch form. Both arch forms have distinct differences, which we will individually uh, discuss later. This is the part where we're going to actually discuss the differences. Section E alone contains the inner arch form. There are two subsections repeated in reverse order with a contrasting middle section. If you look, you can see one, two, three, two, one. Three is the middle section, and then is the mirror form within E. The repeated subsections are the same verbatim, meaning note by note, it is the same. One and one is exactly the same note by note. Two and two is exactly the same note by note. And then three separates those two uh, subsections. 
On the next one here, on the outer, the outer arch form does not include sections C and D. There are five sections repeated in reverse order after the contrasting middle section. The difference between the outer and the inner is that the outer uh, does not, is not the same verbatim, meaning that we have the same thematic material to where you can hear it and say, it sounds like this, but certain notes are altered, um, <clears throat> excuse me, certain notes are altered so that way each section for harmonic consonant transitions. We want, to, we want it to sound smooth when you go backwards to move uh, into what you hear or orally. Um, the next part we're going to be talking about is the sectional characteristics to show the differences and relations in each section. All right, and this we have the full form again. If you look here, you can see that A basically has a groove without the melody. That's the characteristics. A prime is a variation of A, which means it sounds very similar, but it's not the same. And you can see how they're related. Uh, B is the main theme in stirring. B prime embellish is the embellishment to the main theme. And then B double prime is embellishes the main theme for the more. And then for E, both instruments work together to form a single musical idea for each subse uh, subsection. Now we're going to talk about the sectional characteristics of C and D. I wanted to discuss them lastly in the sections of characteristics because they stand out within the form of stirring as a whole. So C and D stands out from everything else. Um, sections C and D are, seg are segments where the roles of a featured melody, uh, featured extended melody, and accompaniment are present. More simply explained, section C and D is where each instrument individually holds the musical attention of the audience. Um, in section C, the marimba, has the uh, featured extended melody and the double seconds has the accompaniment. Section D reverses the roles of both instruments. So if we look here, I'm going to show you the impressions of the accompaniment effects on C and D. So we're going to talk about how the melodies are affected by the accompaniment. So in section C, the accompaniment has continual arpeggios without rhythmic breaks. When you were at the 16th notes, it was non-stop and it just kept going. And then in the section D, the accompaniment by the marimba has rhythmic breaks and more silence between the patterns of each measure. You kind of heard it, it was kind of slower. That's what that how it appeared to be. Now, this, this bottom C and D is how it's affected, all right? So, C having the continual arpeggios without rhythmic breaks, it causes the featured melody of C to sound comparable and connected to the B sections. Meaning it's a little bit hard to tell, hmm, where did C start for that, for the marimba extended uh, uh, melody. And the accompaniment for D having the rhythmic breaks and more silence between the patterns of each measure, it caused the still pan of D, the featured extended melody, to have the aural appearance of a written improvised solo. But it was, but it was, uh, it was written, but you would think, oh, okay, it sounds very improvised. <laughs> but that was not the case. Um, the next we're going to talk about is the tonality of the full form of stirring. Here, you can see three different modes of scales. We have F-sharp Aeolian, F-sharp Dorian, and C-sharp Aeolian. For those that are not familiar with how these things are set up, I have placed the notes F-sharp, G-sharp, in the order of what you would use in that scale, diatonically. So sections A, A prime, B, B prime, and B double prime, they are in F-sharp Aeolian. Basically, there are no accidentals with outside of the key as we played. Section E is uh, in C sharp Aeolian, which you can see in the green. Here's something interesting. If you look at that, this is the reason, I'm gonna give you the reason why section C shares the colors pink and blue, all right? The tonality in the first eight measures of section C is ambiguous, meaning that it can be identified as F sharp Dorian or F sharp Aeolian, it can be either. 
This is why it could, it's ambiguous. The use of D natural and D sharp is interchangeably used in the first eight measures. Starting from the ninth measure of section C, the constant use of D sharp keeps us in the key, uh, at the mode of F sharp Dorian. Next, we're gonna talk about the musical forces and agential energies. The first person I'd like to talk about is Steve Larson with the musical forces. Steve Larson, he is widely published and famous in the area of music theory. In his book, Musical Forces, Motion, Metaphor, and Meaning in Music, he explains through metaphorical application of physical forces regarding melodic and rhythmic pattern. Larson's theory of musical forces includes gravity, magnetism, and inertia. We are going to go further into these definitions through examples as, as we go through with CERN. The next one is dealing with agential energies with Robert S. Hatton. Uh, Robert Hatton, he's a professor of music theory at the University of Texas in Austin at this moment. Um, in his article, Musical Forces and Agential Energies, an expansion of Steve Larson's model, Hatton builds on Larson's theory of musical forces, which were gravity, magnetism, and inertia, to develop a distinction between environmental forces and agential energies. Hatton's forms of agential energies are momentum, friction, and repulsion, repulsion. So remember, the agential energies are built off of musical forces. I will now de uh, generally define, generally define, the uh, and show evidence of these concepts within Stern. The first one we have is gravity. Gravity is described as the tendency of a melody to descend. In this red box, this is where the melody you heard on the steel pan where it descended. Here's the audio example of this. That's a lot of notes that fail. Uh, <laughs> but that's gravity, that's what happens. You pick up something and you drop it. Makes sense, right? Uh, the next one is magnetism. Magnetism is when ornamenting notes resolve to structural tones. In these two boxes, you have D sharp resolving to E natural. The reason why it's magnetism and the notes resolve is because in this key, diatonically within the key, it would be D natural, but D sharp is outside of that key, which makes it feel unstable, to which makes you want to actually get closer to E. Now, magnetism, this is something off, just off the books slightly, but, well, it's not off the books, it's in the books, he said it. <laughs> but for magnetism, for magnetism, between those two notes, Magnetism can happen in any of the pieces on a longer time base or even shorter. It can be quarter notes, sixteenth notes. It can be a whole note. It can be five measures of holding an unstable note. The, the, what we're looking for is for the note to resolve to a structural tone. Because magnetism, it wants to go there. So here is the, it's very quick, but here is the magnetism that you want to hear. All right, the next one is inertia. Inertia is when the given state, process, or pattern continues. All right, for this one, basically, if you look through, you have the 16th note pattern continuing throughout these four measures. I'm going to let you hear the constant pattern of 16th notes for these four measures. <laughs> Momentum. Momentum and inertia are interconnected. When I say that, remember, momentum is built from uh, inertia. Let me give you an analogy to help you understand how these are connected. Momentum would be seen as the pieces to a puzzle, and inertia is the full picture. Inertia was, were basic, was basically all of the 16th notes. But for the momentum, we're breaking them down into the groups of four sixteenth notes ascending. Da 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 da. And as it ascends, the pattern of that ascending. And here I'm going to point when this begins to show them where momentum happens. Right here. You 
can hear and feel the momentum as it keeps going. Friction. Friction has a drag field caused by moving upward. It takes energy to move upward, so it has a, a drag field to help. It feels like it's pulling you back. And um, this is where the upward motion, I'm going to play this and I'm going to let you hear. And it sounds like it's dragging, but it's in time. So you can hear that it has a drag feel to it. Um, repulsion. Let's talk about repulsion. Repulsion is the opposite of magnetism. Not harmonically, but rhythmically in this example, there is the action of repelling the attraction and resolving rhythmic dissonance. All right? Inside this red box is the work of triple versus dual. We'll talk about that between the two instruments. The audio example will play a few measures before the repulsion. In this example, you see, it will play a little bit, but I will point when this point is about to happen. And you will hear the repulsion, all right? So that is double, triple, it sounds like uh, the, rhythm, the rhythm does not match. That's repulsion for itself. Um, next, we're going to be talking about uh, measure preserving. Um, with double versus triple concerning stirring as a whole, triple appears to be the dominant sub uh, subdivision within stirring. Here's the example of duple and triple, so you can have an understanding of the difference. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. That's duple. Triple would be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. I'm going to play them back and forth, one and one, without saying anything in between. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So when we talk about duple and triple, this is what we need, all right? So, in this example, there are four switches between double, uh, double and triple, like duple and triple happening with the marimba. The color red is duple, the color blue is triple. The marimba is in triple before the first change happens. It switches to duple, goes back to triple, switches to duple, goes back to triple, and then it stays there. The steel pan, as it's accompanying this, uh, the melody, it stays triple subdivision throughout the entire example. Here's the next one. In this example with the steel pans as the melody, there's a high number of mixing between duple and triple. There is no specific rhythmic pattern here, <laughs> okay? Red is still duple, while blue is still triple. The mixings change according to the fluid harmonic melody of the double steel pan. Uh, the marimba stays within triple subdivisions throughout the entire example. It was too much to try to put the marimba within that, but it stays triple, just as the steel pan did when it was the marimba's turn. Now, let's talk about the intro and outro of section E. I love this part. <laughs> What's cool is that section E is duple the whole time. So remember, the whole piece is very dominant and triple, but section E by itself is duple the entire time. We are going to discuss how we got in and how we got out. So now, uh, both of the instruments are in triple prior to what you see in this example, all right? In the first measure in red, the marimba switches to duple while the pan is still in triple. The second measure in blue, the pan joins the marimba in duple. Then section E begins. The audio example will play a few measures before this repulsion that happens here. Um, but I will cue you where the red box where the red box begins. <laughs> Thank you. 
questions concerning uh, Google and Triple afterwards. I welcome you to ask me these questions in any of these sections. Um, now, let's look into the outro. That was the intro into section E. First, I would like to, I want to know what do you hear? I'm going to play an audio example to you, and I want you to try to feel the beat, and I want you to see what happens. So you're just listening, and you're trying to feel the beat. That's all you're doing now.
I also had the embellished, uh, embellished theme used in Stern. Here's the first example. So the next one, uh, the second borrow theme is Dance of the Nights, um, and this one is from Sergei uh, Prokofiev. Um, from Dance of the Nights, I've taken two parts of different melodies and mixed them with embellishments. In stirring, the second melody is broken in half, while the first melody is interpolated between both halves. In the example, the red shows the first name, and the blue shows the second theme. This audio example um, is the recording of the original piece. This piece will play for about two minutes. So I would like for you to listen and pay attention to repeated themes. <coughs> This piece means a lot to me for it, and 
This is how our story is connected to this one as a summary. There have been many times to where we would not have that much time together, be in different states, be further away. And then we would have time to spend with each other, visiting. We would, we love to converse, love to talk, just love to be around each other, just being in each other's presence. And then we would just randomly talk about anything, no intention of the topic. Then something becomes interesting. And then we start to talk more on it, on that subject. We become more interested in that, in that subject of what we're talking about. But then at the same time, we have different point of views and different perspectives of how we see the topic. And we would share it with each other. This is what I believe. This is, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking. And although we have different point of views, we're trying to respect each other, but then tensions and, and emotions are rising because you know, oh, okay, no, but this is what I'm trying to I'm trying to respect it. This is the conversation with rise. And it would, the emotions of the opinions of the point of views rose to its peak to where it would cause it to break. But then there was always that one point to where we would become synchronized and understand, like we would be on the same page and understand what the other person was really saying. And then we would use the next time to review we go backwards and review everything we talked about. We talked about our different point of views, and then we talked about the, in the interesting subjects, and then we talked about how, how it was random. And then, in the story you can see, we always end up exactly where we began in the conversation, and we would grow closer to each other as this happened, just by talking. Um, so um, the narrative of two brothers here like I said again, it's a story that describes a form of stirring. The A sections, as you see here, it does um, does not have to have it does not have a designated melody, just as the brothers can enjoy and talk about anything without an intention. The B sections have a melody that is embellished over time, just as the brothers became more curious in the newly uh, focused topic. Section C and D are featured melody segments where both brothers respected each other and expressing their thoughts. Section E is the climax where the brothers' emotions were at its peak. The third subsection of E is when the brothers play together, showing that the conversation becomes synchronized. The rest of stirring in arch form represents the brothers re-examining this experience of growing closer through dialogue exchange. Stirring here, we were going to play this one more time in conclusion of the lecture assignment. If you have any questions, please feel free to share them with me after we are finished here this evening. I hope all of this information can cause this musical piece to have deeper meaning and assist in helping you to enjoy the music even greater than before. Thank you.
Thank you.